Item Number SCP-129 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-129 is at large in the world and infects large numbers of humans and animals daily. As such, containment efforts are focused on treatment of infected individuals and on eradication of any or all member species of SCP-129. Although at least 98% of the world's population harbors a natural immunity to one or more species of SCP-129, outbreaks that reach stage 3 or higher must be contained as quickly as possible, with infected individuals quarantined under highest risk contagion protocols. In the event of stage 4 or stage 5 outbreak, in addition to the above procedures, data expunged. Description SCP-129 is a series of different species of fungus that can infect any animal with mucosal membranes. Infection by SCP-129 can pass through up to five stages. Depending on exposure to further member species of SCP-129, individual resistance, and other factors, with each stage of infection facilitating progression to the next stage by weakening the individual's resistance to subsequent infection. Due to a combination of historical events, most humans and animals are naturally immune to SCP-1294 through SCP-129. Therefore, outbreaks of stage 3 infections are quite rare, but have the potential for widespread infection if not swiftly isolated and contained. All known cases of SCP-129 have followed a five-stage progression, although data expunged, possibly due to mutation. Stage 1 The first organism, SCP-129-1, attacks the victim's mucosal membranes, multiplying quickly and unobtrusively. A faint yeast-like smell might be detected, but beyond that, SCP-129-1 is asymptomatic. A second organism, SCP-129-2 can then infect the host, causing the victim to experience symptoms identical to those of acute viral nasopharyngitis, the common cold. The decreased efficacy of the host's immune system due to infection from SCP-129-2 allows SCP-129-1 to become entrenched further. SCP-129-1 and 2 generally leave the host body within four to six days. Though both species are fairly widespread, and most of the population has little to no protection against either organism. They pose little danger themselves, except to facilitate infection by SCP-1293. Stage 2 Although SCP-1293 is usually stopped by natural mucus, Stage 1 infection changes the composition of the host's mucus so that the host is significantly less resistant to SCP-1293. Once established in the host, SCP-1293 alters the host's mucus, lymph, and blood such that other species of SCP-129 can thrive in the host. Symptoms of stage 2 infection include greatly increased mucus production, a nagging cough due to excess phlegm, a lingering low-grade fever, increased sweating and salivating, a somewhat increased preference for vegetables, and the complaint that certain fruit juices taste odd. Infection by SCP-1293 generally lasts anywhere from two weeks to four months before being driven out by the immune system, unless the host enters stage 3 infection. At least percent of all humans have experienced stage 2 infection at some point, but due to natural immunities, in spite of stage 2 infection and the relative rarity of stage 3 species, few have passed into stage 3. Stage 3 in the absence of SCP-1293, nearly all animals are immune to the three species that cause stage 3 infection. However, a small number of stage 2 victims can become infected with one or more of these species. In these cases, the fungal infections become entrenched in the host and cannot be removed without extraordinary measures. Individually, the three stage 3 species elicit different symptoms in the host. SCP-1294 causes increased tear production lacrimation, slight yellowing of the eyes. SCP-1295 causes the host's nails to thicken and significantly increases earwax production. SCP-1296 data expunged, in particular, bright yellow urine and small pellets in the host's feces, both of which smell strongly of yeast. However, a victim who becomes infected with all three of these species will, within hours, develop flu-like or worse, symptoms, and become bedridden for three to five weeks. 
Afterward, though the victim appears to have recovered fully, in actuality, SCP-129 has spread throughout all systems in the host's body, marking passage into Stage 4. Stage 4 Victims who reach Stage 4 appear generally healthy and indeed may be more lively and energetic than at any time since first contracting SCP-129. In actuality, SCP-129-1-6 through have spread throughout the host's body, completely infiltrating the subject's immune, respiratory, circulatory, reproductive, and central nervous systems. Mycelia from SCP-129 species also permeate the host's skin and replace some percentage of the host's hair. These hyphae, which are nearly indistinguishable from the host's natural hair, are used to propagate SCP-129 to other hosts. Any potential host that comes into contact with Shedoff Hyphae has an extremely high chance of becoming infected with SCP-129. Hyphae seem to be equally contagious from any part of the host's body. Despite, or perhaps because of, increased susceptibility to SCP-129, Stage 4 victims are much more resistant to viral and bacterial pathogens than uninfected subjects. All known subjects who have reached Stage 4 have either progressed to Stage 5 or died within weeks. Stage 5 Symptoms of Stage 5 infection depend on a variety of factors, including the particular Stage 5 species that are present, as well as genetic, physiological, environmental, and any number of unknown factors. However, as in Stage 4, all Stage 5 victims are highly contagious and can infect victims who had previously shown complete immunity. Notable Manifestations of Stage 5 Symptoms February Witnesses riding in a commuter train car described a woman suddenly blowing up like a balloon and exploding, but instead of blood and viscera, the contents of the car were covered in spores and filaments. Analysis later showed that the victim was infected with SCP-1299, SCP-12914, and SCP-129. All persons and objects in the affected area were quarantined, euthanized, and incinerated per protocol. Several casualties, including Foundation personnel. May Following a string of disappearances in data expunged were tracked to a cave several kilometers from town. Inside, investigators found several pulsating mounds of flesh and vegetative material. Although most were unrecognizable, a few of the entities retained some human characteristics and were identified as some of the missing citizens. Researchers theorized that victims of this combination of SCP-129 would interact normally with the populace, attempting to infect others, until, after a period of time, they would come to the cave. How and why they were brought here is not known. Upon arrival, the victims would be changed into the pulsating vegetative flesh mounds, which appear to be organisms modified to provide a long-term source of sustenance for SCP-129. Analysis suggests the flesh mounds could potentially live for several years. Autopsy revealed the presence of SCP-12910, SCP-12911, SCP-12914, and SCP-129. Site quarantined and sanitized per protocol. Item Number SCP-135 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-135 is to be contained in a partitioned plexiglass chamber, at least 7 meters to a side. All sections are to be completely sealed off from one another to avoid cross-contamination. SCP-135 itself is to be in a central section, with 1.0 to 1.5 square meters of floor space with a 5 cm wide runoff trench around the perimeter that drains into a tank, the contents of which are to be piped into an incinerator at the end of every week. The remaining space in the containment chamber is to be used to house five chemical harvesting vats, one vat per partition section. A single access corridor is to lead from SCP-135 section to outside the chamber. No personnel are permitted within SCP-135's effect radius. All maintenance, taking of samples, etc are to be carried out by remote control robots. Disciplinary measures need not be taken against personnel that violate this rule, because the direct consequences of SCP-135's effects have been deemed consequence enough. Robots are to be maintained and cleaned by Level 1 personnel. Once a week, SCP-135 section is to be hosed down with solution U-82B until only its outer coating is visible. 
In emergencies, flamethrowers may be employed to reduce mass quickly. Due to the potential catastrophic effects in the event of cross-contamination, at no point are SCP-329 or SCP-427 to be contained within the same facility as SCP-135. Description: SCP-135 is a human female, age undisclosed, that promotes rapid, uncontrolled cell growth within a radius of 2.25 meters from itself. It remains rigidly in the fetal position and has never been observed to move. SCP-135's effect is carcinogenic to animal tissue and induces malignant neoplasia in plant and fungal tissues in 100% of recorded exposure cases, with severity and disorganization increasing exponentially with closer proximity to SCP-135. Within 0.1 meters, cells will not die, even under conditions where they would normally, causing SCP-135 to be steadily buried under a continually growing mass of plant matter, fungal matter, and microorganisms. This undying state extends to SCP-135 cells as well. SCP-135 has been shown to lack an epidermis, instead having a crust of mixed plant and fungal matter that has incorporated itself onto SCP-135's skin, interspersed with tumors and patches of raw dermis. SCP-135's lungs, diaphragm, and intestines are ruptured, and growth extends into the chest and abdominal cavities. It has been fitted with wide diameter plastic tubes for use in draining excess biomatter. The Foundation came into possession of SCP-135 after it and a surrounding ball of growth rolled off a cliff in the mountains, crushing a hiker on the trail below. Class B amnestics were administered to the civilians and law enforcement personnel involved, and the incident was covered up as having been caused by a pair of male goats that slipped and fell off the cliff edge during a dominance battle. Later examination of the growth revealed the partial skeleton of an adult human female, with osteosarcomata covering 1% of it. SCP-135 was found in the space between the skeleton's ribcage and pelvis. A viable DNA sample was recovered from the bone marrow of the pelvis, and testing confirmed that the skeleton belonged to SCP-135's biological mother. All personnel involved with SCP-135's retrieval and initial testing were later diagnosed with various forms of cancer. Out of the affected, only are still alive at the time of this writing. Attempts to terminate SCP-135 with sustained gunfire, flamethrowers, caustic materials, vacuum, and extreme pressure have all failed. Further termination attempts are forbidden by Order of O5 due to SCP-135's potential uses in cultivating useful bacteria. EEGs confirm full brain activity. No attempts to communicate with SCP-135 are to be made at this time. Item Number SCP-164 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Cultures of SCP-164 should be contained using standard Class III biohazardous procedures and stored clearly marked within a refrigerated biocontainment unit at 10 degrees Celsius. While pathogenic, SCP-164 is not highly infectious. While researchers working with raw cultures or infected subjects should use caution, latex gloves and face masks are generally effective at preventing the spread of the disease. Any personnel inadvertently infected will be subject to six months of chemotherapy upon first showing symptoms, and surgery as necessary. Civilian outbreaks should be handled using cover-up procedure ALEF for contagious materials. Description: SCP-164 is a strain of cancerous cells that cause sarcoma-like tumors in host bodies. While cell DNA appears to be primarily derived from human DNA, the cells now effectively exist as unicellular, asexually reproducing parasites. Several characteristics make SCP-164 remarkable. SCP-164 is the only parasitic, transmittable cancer known to infect human beings. Strains are transmittable through, in order of infectiousness, blood contact, sexual intercourse, skin contact, and airborne contact. Chemotherapy and surgery are effective in treating the disease in nearly all stages. Tumors produced by SCP-164 that grow larger than a certain size will, in 75% of cases, follow normal behavior for cancerous sarcomas. 
However, in 25% of cases, host bodily materials will be utilized for the creation of a new separate organism inside the tumor. In the case of multiple tumors, some or all may follow this behavior. Said organisms will apparently begin as zygotes, fertilized ova, and replicate, much like fetuses. Externally, this appears no different from normal tumor production and may go unnoticed in initial stages. Oddly, mature organisms identify as being completely unrelated to the original tumors, corresponding with a previously unknown species of order Tuthida, squids. Removal of organisms show that they are entirely viable in marine conditions and will perform normal actions such as locomotion, catching food, basic defense, reproduction, etc. However, said organisms will also remain entirely viable in the original tumor, rarely moving or shifting position, continuing to grow at a regular rate until the host is killed. The existence and nature of the organisms, SCP-164-2, is often not realized in civilian cases until biopsy or surgery reveals the developed organism. SCP-164 organisms and tumors may interact with host physiology in interesting ways. The following cases are particularly notable. Female D-Class, 23 years old. SCP-164 tumors spawned on uterus walls. Host body apparently recognized the tumor as a human fetus and was delivered normally containing viable SCP-164-2 specimen after nine months. Male D-Class, 30 years old. Tumors spawned on the spinal cord, disrupting the central nervous system. As a result, movement from SCP-164-2 would occasionally cause subjects' limbs to flail, suggesting a cross-wiring of the nervous systems of the two organisms. Biopsy lent support to this hypothesis. Male D-Class, 25 years old. Tumors spawn near the esophagus and windpipe of the subject, in a location that with ordinary growth would normally have blocked off said passages and quickly killed the subject. Instead, the growth of the tumors shifted to the back of the neck, preventing subject from dying before the normal point. Dr. suggests that this may have been a deliberate action taken by SCP-164. Item Number SCP-199 Object Class Plant Containment Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures A garden of SCP-199 has been built at Site-19 for research and containment. The garden is kept in a ventilated containment unit with artificial light suitable for plant growth and an automatic watering system. The ceiling is covered with an electrified grate capable of destroying instances of SCP-199-2. The entire chamber is to be surrounded with a Faraday cage to prevent emission of SCP-199-3. Instances of SCP-199 or SCP-199-2 found outside of containment are to be destroyed with fire or pesticides. Description SCP-199 is a species of fern within the Hymenophilaceae family. SCP-199 is tangentially related to filmy ferns, but is more tolerant to temperature, humidity, pollution, and external damage. The rhizomes of the plants can attach to and grow on most solid surfaces. SCP-199's appearance is similar to that of Thallos liverworts, but its fronds are unique to its species. The fronds of SCP-199 will form into bladders approximately 10 centimeters in diameter, designated SCP-199-2. Eventually, they will fill with hydrogen gas generated by SCP-199, detach from the main plant, and drift into the air. SCP-199-2 will eventually float at one mile above sea level and begin to ripen. During this period, SCP-199-2 will emit SCP-199-3 at an initial rate of one signal per hour, steadily increasing as SCP-199-2 ripens. Once SCP-199-2 is ripe, it will burst, releasing its contents. In most cases, SCP-199-2 is empty, 
and its explosion will not have any consequences. Occasionally, the explosion of SCP-1992 will release seeds that grow into new instances of SCP-199. SCP-1993 refers to radio signals produced by SCP-1992. All radio signals consist of a high-pitched male voice, speaking in Mandarin Chinese, giving analysis reports, consisting of observations made from SCP-1992 and status reports of SCP-1992 itself. Analysis of SCP-1992 has shown that neither the source of the voice nor the radio signals exist, as most instances of SCP-1992 are empty. SCP-199 seems to thrive in polluted environments, implying that it is adapted to grow in heavily populated areas. In addition, SCP-199 is resistant to most pesticides. SCP-199 is most commonly seen growing in chimneys, gardens of large cities, and inside of industrial factories. SCP-199 was originally discovered after residents of Xi'an, China reported balloon-like objects colliding with hotels and interference with radio devices. The source of SCP-1992 was found to be a patch of it within the center of the city. Instances of SCP-199 have been since discovered in several large cities, most notably New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Beijing, and Tokyo. Analysis of SCP-1993 From 09-12-2017 to 09-19-2017, large-scale analysis of SCP-1993 was conducted by the Foundation. Large containment cell number 45 at Site-9 was temporarily converted into a simulated urban area. Five instances of SCP-199 were moved to the area for testing. The following is a transcript of SCP-1993 transmissions as well as notes in italics. This is Staffman Foxtail, launch successful, entering watching mode. Transcript of SCP-1993 after launch of SCP-1992. Name and rank vary per instance. Targets found, beginning following mode. Transcript of SCP-1993 after floating above simulated civilians. Targets performing clumping, engaging. Targets entering phase, Engaging. Transcript of SCP-1993 after floating above a gathering of simulated civilians. Engaging in Armageddon. Transcript of SCP-1993 after floating above a gathering for two minutes. Armageddon failed. Disengaging. Transcript of SCP-1993 after floating above a gathering for five minutes. It is unknown what would occur if Armageddon was successful. Evasive drift initiated. Course moved. Obstacle encountered, moving from course. Transcript of SCP-1993 while avoiding buildings. Single target engaged in protection lists, retreating. Transcript of SCP-1993 after floating above a member of D-Class personnel, disguised as a New York citizen on a balcony. Single target engaged in that of protection, standing by. Transcript of SCP-1993 after floating above a member of D-Class personnel disguised as a New York citizen on a balcony, while the balcony had flowers. Non-target found without that of protection, colored blue. Transcript of SCP-1993 after floating above a balcony with flowers without a civilian. Color changed depending on type of flower. Standing position recovered, entering malign phase. After this was recorded, SCP-1992 instances actively avoided balconies. Unintelligible. The Paragon. Emitted by a contained instance of SCP-1992 while floating above Site-19. Payload ready for deployment soon. Standing by. SCP-1993 as SCP-1992 became close to explosion. Sorry, it looks like we have a mayday here. Please avoid future infertility. SCP-1993 before explosion, when SCP-1992 was empty. We have a complete deployment ready. Pleasure to serve you, sir. SCP-1993 before explosion, when SCP-1992 had spores. If you could tell them I loved them. One instance of SCP-1992 emitted this while idle, and appeared to be cut off mid-sentence. Context unknown. 
Many variations and idle phrases cut out of this document. Addendum. On 09-21-2018, residents of Istanbul, Turkey reported a collective cloud of over 50 instances of SCP-1992. Before a task force could respond to this, all instances simultaneously burst. Instead of seeds, SCP-1992 released an acidic slime that caused severe damage to a road intersection and created three casualties. An ongoing disinformation campaign was released, crediting the source of SCP-1992 to be a bioterrorist attack. The source of this phenomenon was identified to be a patch of SCP-199 on the outskirts of Istanbul. The task force attempted to use fire to destroy these plants. However, SCP-199 reacted with the fire and exploded into acidic green slime, injuring five Foundation agents. Following destruction of the patch, analysis of the soil revealed that SCP-199 had been planted there four weeks earlier. This new variant of SCP-199 has been tentatively designated SCP-199-B. SCP-199-B has also been reported in Mumbai, Lagos, and Mexico City. Near the patch found in Lagos, a partially biodegraded plastic seed packet was recovered buried underground. The front of the packet had a symbol resembling an eye, with a red iris, with a green substance covering a third of the eye. The back of the packet had a symbol strongly resembling the Foundation's shield logo, but with the arrows pointing away from the shield, and three vertical bars covering the shield's inner circle. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now, and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.